I'm Betty Wheeler, and I'm a member of the Environment Committee of the St. Anthony Park Community Council. And I'm going to make introductions tonight, um, but we have some fabulous speakers, and uh, so I uh, want to get started real quickly with that. But first of all, I have just a couple of announcements. First of all, I want to thank all the businesses that made donations for our uh, refreshments tonight, um, and that includes um, Sherratt's Liquor Store on University Avenue, Hampton Park Co-op on Raymond Avenue, Ned Wessenberg of Park Service Mobile on Como, uh, Fo 79 Vietnamese Restaurant on Energy Park Drive, uh, Tim and Tom's Speedy Market on Como, and uh, Burger's Bagels on Energy Park Drive. Um, I'd like to first introduce our guest from PCA, uh, Carrie Palmer. She's the supervisor from uh, in the uh, PCA's Air Data Analysis Unit. And also, uh, David Jones is from the Minnesota Department of Health Site Assessment and Consultation Unit. And David is also uh, going to join us for uh, questions. He is currently the supervisor of the Site Assessment and Consultation Unit in MDH's Environmental Health Division. So a round of applause to welcome them, and Carrie will do the presentation. Okay, well, thank you to, for, to Betty for inviting us here today. And we wanted to share some monitoring that we did in 2016 at St. Anthony Park. So the monitoring that we did was part of a community air monitoring project that the Pollution Control Agency has been doing. It was funded by the Minnesota Legislature in 2013. And the idea of the project was to focus on low income or communities of color, particularly that had impacts from places like highway traffic, air traffic, and industrial sources. We ended up including St. Anthony Park primarily due to community interest. They had comments on our annual network plan, had contacted us with an interest in being there. And that was part of the things we also wanted to do. We wanted to go where communities wanted us and were interested in learning more about their equality. And so we did that monitoring in 2016. And I'll just know if you're interested in the community or monitoring project, at that website, you can go there. It talks about all the different sites where we monitored. You can also find at the back of the room, we had two documents. One was a short summary of our data, just a two-pager. And then the other one was, we only brought a few copies of the second one. And that's a longer document, I think 14 pages or so, that goes into a little bit more depth of what we're finding. The longer document, we just finished that up and it should be on our website in the next, I'd say maybe later this week or, or next week, it should be up there. And I've always found, to, if you go in your browser and put PCA, Community Air Monitoring Project, that's the fastest way, really, to end up getting there. And so we've got the map there on where our site was actually located. It's where that yellow dot is, is where the site was. So kind of in that corner with the U of M Transit Way and Highway 280 and right off Robin Street. And we also had labeled the St. Anthony Park Community Gardens because there were some, some community members who expressed some interest in that as well. So for the pollutants that we monitored, we kind of had a set of pollutants that we monitored at all these different community air monitoring sites. And they included fine particles, or PM 2.5. And from a health perspective, that's one of the major pollutants that the Pollution Control Agency is interested in. And if you look, we kind of have a little diagram there. Of, these are very, very tiny particles. So that diagram's showing uh, human hair and showing that there might be you know, 20 fine particles that you could line up on the diameter of a human hair. So they're very small. You know, they can get, they're breathed in. Our systems aren't really set up to block those kind of particles. So studies have shown that there can potentially be cardiovascular and um, respiratory effects from those pollutants. We also monitored large particles called total suspended particulate. And those are basically any particles that are suspended in the air, we just capture in a filter and weigh how many of them that there are. Those tend to be less of a concern from a health perspective, just because our bodies are better equipped to trap those pollutants, but they still can definitely be a nuisance. They can be you know, dust, dirt, 
You know, you might cough if you're around a lot of those. And one of the reasons actually that we monitor those pollutants was because that's what we get our metals off of. And those are the air toxics that we monitor. They include metals, volatile organic compounds, and carbonyls. So the metals come off those total suspended particulate samples. So they could be, the metals could be anywhere from on really large particles to on very small particles. Uh, the volatile organic compounds, they're things like benzene, um, tetrachloroethylene, maybe things that you think of as solvents would fall in the VOCs. And the reason that we have a third category of carbonyls is really because we collect those in a different way. We use a different monitor, a different method. And they're things like formaldehyde and acetaldehyde. VOCs is where we get the most compounds, like over 50 compounds of VOCs. And there's around six or seven carbonyls. And if you look in that longer report, we actually list everything that we monitored and what the results were for those monitors. Um, in general, most of the pollutants that we looked at met standards and benchmarks. Uh, fine particles, there's a standard for fine particles, a national standard called National Ambient Air Quality Standard. And there is a state standard for total suspended particulate. There used to be a national standard, but as they became more concerned with the finer particles getting into people's systems, they became less concerned with the, those larger particles, and eventually EPA doesn't have a standard for it anymore, but we kept our state standard, so that still exists. So for the total suspended particulate, it didn't meet what we call kind of the state welfare standard. There's two kinds of standards for a lot of pollutants. They're either a primary or health-based standard, and there are secondary, which are more welfare. So it's more nuisance, it could be soiling of buildings or crop damage, that type of thing, as opposed to direct human health effects. So the total suspended particulate did not go over the primary health standard, but it did go over one of those state secondary welfare standards. And only three of the air toxics we saw over a health benchmark. And very roughly, we define a health benchmark as the concentration of a pollutant that if you're exposed to over a lifetime is unlikely to cause any health effects. And so again, you know, we monitored all of these for a year, not a lifetime, but we use those basically in a lot of cases as a screening type value. For arsenic and formaldehyde, they both have numbers from the Department of Health that are used for those screening guidelines. Whereas cobalt does not, it actually, we have a kind of a tiered way that we look at our benchmarks and it starts with, we look for the Department of Health's benchmarks first. Then we look at EPA's kind of first tier benchmarks. They have an IRIS database that we use. If there's nothing there, we'll look at um, the state of California. They have a lot of research and do a lot of study into the toxicology of pollutants. So they often have some really good numbers. And then kind of one of the last places we look at some of these second tier EPA standards and it's actually used for their Superfund program. And so that's where the cobalt number is coming from. So for screening wise, there's some uncertainty around what that would be if we looked more closely at it. Oh, there we go. The, those should be dots. That's just the difference, I think, between using a different laptop. But so where the little hash marks are, these are other monitoring sites that we have in the Minneapolis and St. Paul area. And when I show you some of the graphics, we'll be comparing to some of those sites just to kind of give you a feel for what does the St. Paul park sites look like versus other places that we monitor. And some of these we've monitored a really long time. The Humboldt Avenue site, it's on a fire station in North Minneapolis, and we've been there for quite a long time. Um, Lowry Avenue and Pacific Avenue, those are sites that are very locally source impacted. And when you see a lot of these concentrations, you'll see they have higher concentrations at those two sites. And that's an area that we're actively working with industry in that area to try to see lower concentrations. City of Lakes building, that's in downtown Minneapolis. Um, the St. Anthony Park site that we discussed. H.C. Anderson School is a school in the Phillips neighborhood of Minneapolis. And then Harding High School is another one of our longer term sites in St. Paul. And the St. Paul Downtown Airport is another site that we only monitored in 2016. It was actually some follow up from an earlier camp site that we had had. And we were only doing metals at that site. And that's just another note, we aren't necessarily monitoring every pollutant to every one of these locations. So sometimes the charts won't show 
all of the locations either. For example, we don't monitor PM 2.5 at Lowry Avenue or Pacific Avenue. And like I said, at the St. Paul Downtown Airport, we only had metals in the total suspended particulate. So the first one, like I mentioned, we were not above a standard for the fine particles. And here we're comparing St. Anthony Park with Harding High School in St. Paul and at H.T. Anderson School in the Phillips neighborhood. So we're seeing very similar concentrations for PM 2.5, which is generally what we see in the Twin Cities area. We do see very similar concentrations of it. And we don't seem to see as much of that source located, that it's more of a regional pollutant. The primary standard is 12 microgram per meter cubed, and that's the annual standard. So I'm comparing here to an annual. So we're at nearly half that concentration. And I just want to mention, it is fine particles are a real success story. We've seen much lower concentrations over the last few years. In fact, I'd say, you know, seven, eight years ago, we were concerned about the levels maybe being over the standard for PM 2.5, and we've really seen a drop. And we're attributing a lot of that to reduced coal-fired power plants, both closures and having cleaner equipment, as well as cleaner vehicles. When we look at, you know, the things that make up particles, we're really seeing those concentrations go down. So that, that's really good news. So another one I wanted to show is this total suspended particulate. And again, this one's a little bit busier. So those are the annual concentrations, so in microgram per meter cubed. And the lines there, that's at secondary or welfare standard. And this is the annual one, and we weren't over the annual one, which is why we were only over the daily standard. And then the red line is that health or primary standard. So this is where I was talking about that Lowry Avenue and Pacific Avenue. Where you see those on there, they're usually going to be the highest concentration because they, are, they have industrial sources in the area that we know are contributing to higher concentrations, especially of metals and total suspended particulate in that area. And they have regularly exceeded our state total suspended particulate standards. Otherwise, St. Anthony Park similar, for example, to the City of Lakes building, but it is one of the higher ones of the ones that we've looked at. We think a lot of that is because of dust in the area. There's a rail yard in that area. There's some open areas that aren't paved and don't have grass cover or vegetation cover. And so when we look at the daily one, so this is showing each day that we monitored. And in general, we monitor once in every six days and that's what this is showing, those results every six days. Again, we've got the primary, in this case, the daily standard in that red line, in that secondary welfare standard in yellow. And then the lines below, St. Anthony Park is that black line. Uh, the purple is the St. Paul Downtown Airport. And again, we were partially there because we knew there were some concerns with the total suspended particulate and potentially metals in that area. And you can see that the two high days where we went over that welfare standard were days that we tended to peak across the Twin Cities. They were really windy days. And so we think what happened essentially is anywhere there was dust, they were really getting picked up and elevating the concentrations across the Twin Cities. You know, in areas that were dustier or had more open soils that could be moved, had higher concentrations. Some of them that had less of that had lower concentrations. Sure. So the question was, is this something that the PCA would pursue further, or is it more of an anomaly? To be honest, we would probably view it more as an anomaly. It's not that uncommon to have a few days that are higher for the total suspended particulate. And the fact that we only had two makes us less concerned. To go over the standard, actually, you have to have two. There's one. Like, the first one sort of doesn't count. And then you have the second one. And when we have areas, like I said, in that um, Lowry Pacific area where they were going over on a weekly basis, that's where we started to get more concerned about the numbers. And especially because we're looking at a welfare standard and not a health standard in this case. So then I wanted to talk about those three air toxics that I mentioned that we're over the benchmark on. This first one's arsenic. I'll try to give a little more explanation of what you're seeing here. In this case, we have the health benchmark 
to the right. In general, a lot of the, the metals benchmarks are very, very low. So we're still talking about extremely low concentrations. In fact, for arsenic, our detection limit's so low that in a lot of cases, if we detect it, we're probably over the benchmark because our detection limit, just those levels are getting so low, it's getting hard for us even to detect them at where those benchmarks are. The blue part that you see is the mean or average concentration. And what you see at the green is the 95% upper confidence level. And basically that's saying that at the top of that, you're 95% sure that your real mean isn't higher than that concentration. And our risk assessors tend to like to use that value just to be protective when we're doing comparisons to the monitoring data. We do tend to see arsenic around, and again, you know, that Lowry Avenue, you'll see that trend. They, that area tends to have the highest concentrations, but we do see arsenic around, and we'll get a few hits. And actually, if you look at this data, a lot of the days we didn't detect arsenic at all when we monitored. It's just that the days that we did, we saw numbers over the health benchmark. And in particular, that one was driven just by one high day. And that's why that green line is so big. And usually that 95% UCL wouldn't be that much higher than the average because it's, if you kind of follow statistics at all, it's a skewed number because you're kind of here and then you've got one over here. So when you do the statistics on it, it makes that 95% UCL a lot more uncertain. So in this case, again, it was driven by one high day and it's just a little over the benchmark with the 95% UCL, and we do see arsenic. It, it is a naturally occurring pollutant. It is in the soils. Again, you know, we suspect that there's a good possibility that that's the issue, kind of like the TSP. And when we did, a, we did some windrows, like looking at it, well, what direction is the wind coming from when we see higher concentrations? In this case, it was coming from the east. If you're interested, I did make some wind roses, but I put those at the end in case that was more than you guys wanted to see. So cobalt's a little more unusual because we don't usually see cobalt. That's not one that we frequently see a detection at all for it. Again, except for Lowry and Pacific. Where <laughs> and there is a, scrap, a large scrapyard in that area where we think some of those metals are probably coming from. So in this case, it was a little unusual to see cobalt. And again, we have the health benchmark. It's going to note it probably should just be 0 0.001. I think we have a couple additional numbers there that we don't need. But so both the average and the 95% UCL in this case were over the benchmark. In general, we didn't see it detected at other sites except for that Lowry and Pacific area. And even at St. Anthony Park in general, we didn't see it detected. It was mostly from the southeast that we would see it. So we suspect there's some kind of local source, but we don't know, you know if it's a soil contamination, like past soil issue, if there's an active emission of it, you know, and we, aren't, we don't know what size particle that it was sitting on. So we know it's there. And also the number's really questionable. Like I mentioned before, it's not one that the Department of Health has really looked at. One of those reasons being that we just haven't seen it anywhere. Often what we'll do with our health benchmarks is we'll use these screening values. Then if we find something that's a concern, we might go talk to the health department and say, hey, could you look at this and let us know if you have any more guidance around it. And the last pollutant I wanted to share was formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is very different from the metals that I showed over the total suspended particulate. It tends to be over the benchmark across the Twin Cities metro area. And it's a very complicated chemical. A lot of it is formed from other pollutants in the air. It's about three times higher in the summer than it is in the winter. And part of that, you know, it's warmer temperatures, there's more reactions, you get more formaldehyde being formed. So it's very typical. It's typical, you see it in other metropolitan areas as well. And in fact, in the south, it's even quite a bit higher than it is here, which makes sense again, because they've got warmer temperatures. They probably don't get that you know, lower formaldehyde in the winter that we see here. And so kind of across the board, over the benchmark, um, St. Anthony Park's very similar to the City of Lakes building. 
and but all those concentrations aren't really that different. I suspect some of it may be that proximity to traffic. For a lot of these locations that we see it just a little bit higher, it is near traffic. I think even the Lowry Avenue, in that case, when we looked at the wind direction, it wasn't really pointing at the facilities as much as it was pointing at the highway. But it's an ongoing investigation that we're doing. We're trying to do some uh, modeling to better understand exactly what the sources are, because we know generally, but we don't know what would we need to lower to get formaldehyde down. Uh, the other note on that is the Department of Health has looked at that number. It's another one that there's uncertainty around some of the studies. And right now their guidance is a range between 2 and 10 microgram per meter cubed. We always use the lowest range as our screening value just to have a chance to you know, take a closer look at things. But even these numbers are still kind of in that lower end of that range that they've put together. So kind of overall, just in summary, is in general, the pollution levels were pretty similar to other Twin Cities areas. And you know, most of the pollutants we monitored were either below the detection limit or well below any kind of standard or benchmark, with the exception of the ones I talked about today. And they said this, that total suspended particulate was high on two days, but that seemed to be kind of a regional high wind issue. And in general, even arsenic and cobalt on most days were below the detection limit, but from those certain wind directions, it, they were higher, and they're high enough to have their average be a little over their health benchmarks. And again, formaldehyde is over the health benchmark across the Twin Cities and is one that we're actively looking at to better understand what that is and is there anything that we can do to impact it. I also wanted to let you know that we have a lot of our data on our website. And I will say the data that we have out there is more if you really want to look into it and compare to different sites or look at different years, that this is a place that you can go. Again, probably going MPCA air data might be your fastest way to get there. But we also have it if you go to our website and you can pick air and then air data and get there as well. And we have an air toxics data explorer, and that's looking at like those metals, VOCs, and carbonyls I mentioned, and a criteria pollutant data explorer, and that one's looking at pollutants that have standards and have those federal standards. And, and we also have a list of our current air monitoring sites and what's monitored at each of those locations. So you're welcome to look there. And you're also welcome to contact Derek or I anytime, either about the data, to here at um, St. Anthony Park or any of our other data, or you know, if you're looking at the state explorers and trying to better understand what you see. We know they're a little complicated yet, we're still working on trying to make them a little easier to use. So I always welcome input on that as well, because sometimes we think things are easy because we've done it for 20 years. <laughs> but So I don't know, the only other thing, I do have those wind direction plots. I don't know if people are interested in looking at those. I can. Put those out quickly. I made it for arsenic and cobalt. For formaldehyde, it wasn't really very useful because we know it's, it's much more by what days are hot than what wind direction things are coming from. But so this is the arsenic plot. And like I, s so basically this is showing, if you see the red, that's the highest concentrations. And the direction that's pointing in is the direction that it came from. So you see red and orange, those would be the biggest concentrations. Like I mentioned, for formaldehyde, we really had you know, one high day. That's that red, and it came from the east. The length of those poles are just how often the wind blew from that direction. It doesn't have anything to do with the actual concentration. And then similarly, for the cobalt, you can see we had a few higher concentration days. And in general, you know, that was coming from the southeast is the direction, you know, we had one little bit higher concentration that came from the west, you know, it's a little, all of this is a little tricky, and plus you're looking at a day sample, you know, the wind direction switches during the day, so you're looking at an average concentration with an average wind direction for a day. So there's always some uncertainty in it, but it looks like whatever it's coming from probably is from the southeast. And in, then in a lot of those days, like all that blue, you know, probably was pretty close, was a non-detect. Yeah, we are looking around a little bit and looking through our emissions inventory and kind of looking at, you know, what facilities or if there's other things, you know, that could be a source. 
So that is something that we're taking a look at. Well, that's it. That's the part that we know it's secondary formation. It can come from a lot of different pollutants. So we know that, but we don't know what the primary things are. And that's why we're doing, we have some people working on doing kind of a big photochemical model to try to better understand what are the primary sources that are creating the formaldehyde. Because it ends up being the type of pollutants, what's photoreactive, it's, it's a complex thing. We know traffic's a source, but we don't know if it's the primary source. So there's a question around wood smoke, and wood smoke has been an issue that we're looking at, because we can do monitoring, but some of it is, we, we know fine particles aren't good for your health. And so a lot of what we've been doing is really trying to get information out there for people about how to burn cleaner, you know, where it's appropriate to burn and being more sensitive to your neighbors. And we do have some options. We have some personal air monitors. They aren't regulatory monitors, but we are willing to share those with people too if they just want to demonstrate, you know, that there's higher concentrations in the smoke. I know we use some of those. I used it during the 4th of July fireworks and it went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and by a campfire, so that's one thing. We also have a project that we're working on right now with, again, some money from the legislature, some of the LCCMR money, in which we're doing a sensor project, and it has a smaller suite of chemicals, but one of them are particles, where we're putting them in different zip codes, well, hopefully getting in all the zip codes in Minneapolis and St. Paul, to, to help better understand are there some of those more micro-scale differences. And the hope is that this project goes well, that it could maybe be one that communities could use and put more in their community as well to see some of those differences. You know, I, I don't want to answer that just because I, there was a question about cement, if we'd expect more arsenic, just because I haven't looked at it carefully yet, but that's something we certainly could look at to see if it could be a potential source. Right, okay, there was a question on the metals, and I'll be honest, I don't know if we have one of the reports there. I could go in the back and read off exactly what they are. But we have lead, we have arsenic, we have cobalt. I don't know, Derek, do you have any more off the top of your head? Iron, zinc. Oh, yeah, chromium, that's another one that can quite frequently be over the benchmark that has a very low benchmark. So, and, and in that report, we do have a list of all of them, too. And we kind of focused on the ones that were over. And lead's another one that we take a really close look at. Yep. Yeah, there's a question on rooftop versus ground level. And I'd say from doing that, this camp monitoring, that is one thing that we think has shown up. Because in general, St. Anthony Park wasn't one of them, but at most of the camp monitors, we had higher fine particles. And we think that's attributed mainly to the fact that we're ground level. So yeah, somewhat maybe a little bit higher metals and higher fine particles is what we've seen. Not so much with the VOCs or those pollutants. Right. There was a question about the trends. Is the air quality getting better or worse in the Twin Cities? In general, I'd say overall better. That most of the air toxics have gone down. Like I said, the fine particles have gone down pretty dramatically. Ozone is another pollutant that we look at. It, that's gone down somewhat, not as much. And again, formaldehyde, that one of the reasons that we're looking at it too, not just because it's over the benchmark, but it's kind of the one pollutant that's been pretty flat, that we haven't seen it decrease as much as everything else. But yeah, overall, air quality has actually gotten significantly better. There was a question about wildfires. Should we pick them up? We definitely can pick them up. Again, it's kind of, there's some atmospheric anomalies where it'll sit up there and it'll dip down. So sometimes it misses us entirely. If anyone follows our air quality index, and that's something where we report daily, if we have high numbers, recently it's often been because of the wildfires. So yeah, they definitely, and that's where you'll see the fine particles can get really high. Ozone is another one that can get pretty high from the fine particles. And I think in 2016, we just, well, and plus we're in one in six where some of our other monitors are continuous. Although the fine particles, I think that was a continuous monitor, so we did have daily numbers for fine particles. But yeah, we'll, we will pick it up sometimes. So question, do we have outstate monitors? We don't have very many for air toxics, and part of it, well, part of it is because we expect the highest concentrations to be here. We have a couple in Duluth. And we, we did like 10, well, 20 years ago, <laughs> we did a study, a, 
a statewide study because we wanted to better understand the air toxics. We do have some of the criteria pollutants, though, the pollutants with standards outside the metro area. And that's like the fine particles, ozone. And those ones, those are the ones that we use for the air quality index. And so we do try to get more of a reading across the state for them. Yep. There was a question if these are all long term or chronic benchmarks. The ones I reported tonight are long term. All of those, so all of those are looking kind of at a lifetime of exposure. We do have short term benchmarks as well, and they're one hour benchmarks, and we always screen for those. In general, we're never anywhere close. So usually we don't even report on them and unless we see something. Thank you, Carrie. And um, we really appreciate the presentation and once again, we want to uh, express our appreciation for the PCA coming to monitor in our, uh, our neighborhood uh, and include us in your uh, program and uh, with the funding you had for that uh, year. It's uh, always better if uh, we have some, some data to go on than just worry whether you have a problem and no one took a look at it. So we really appreciate uh, your efforts and uh, all the crew that we're here, uh, we're wonderful, the field crew, and so please express our thank you to them, too. Very good. And we have a, another presentation we want to make tonight, um, and this is a, a different project, but this was a project that, um, again, was sponsored by the Environment Committee of the St. Anthony Park Community Council. And um, the uh, probably the person that took the greatest lead on that is Mr. Michael Russell, and he's here. And um, he uh, is right now currently the co-chair of the Environment Committee of uh, the Community Council. Um, he is a scientist by training and inclination, he says. Uh, he's happy to have time to contribute uh, to the community. He does an awful lot of work for our community. Um, he's also on uh, the, the board at the Community Council. and. Uh, He's been uh, an enormous leader in our community, taking uh, the lead on so many projects, uh, Transition Town and, and so many other projects. Uh, so he's been uh, a wonderful uh, help to uh, the improvement of our, our uh, environment in uh, St. Anthony Park. Uh, this project was uh, mostly, I think, uh, pretty much uh, steered by uh, Michael and um, we also got some funding, that, um, the funding was uh, uh, through a grant written by uh, the uh, staff of the community council. And we had two interns that did a lot of the, the work for that. And initially, um, the, the first intern was Amanda Yang, and she's not here tonight. And then our second intern um, that um, worked on this project is Anna Begay. And Anna's here tonight, and she's going to help present uh, the results of, of that program. Uh, I'll introduce you to her. Um, Anna is, um, has been working with uh, the community council for about six months, and uh, she uh, prefers the, the pronouns she, her, or they, them. She has five years of um, uh, bicycling and alternative transportation advocacy and uh, she's passionate about connecting local groups and to local data. Okay, so this project came about, um, as Betty mentioned, uh, there was another intern a few years ago working with the environmental community uh, committee to um, get some uh, data that's relevant for St. Anthony Park. Um, and all of this came from um, a publicly available data set put out by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency um, called What's in My Neighborhood. Uh, so basically, this topic will be going over a way that you can spend that, those beautiful few hours between dinner and bedtime looking at a map and really exploring what is in our neighborhood of St. Anthony Park. Um, so some just background on this, um, you can Google this, what is in my neighborhood. This will give you all of their background on how to get into this data set. Um, you can search it and use it by topic. Um, are you interested in 
air quality monitoring or um, hazardous waste production or uh, there are also some on shipping containers. Not relevant for San Anthony Park, but you can find that. Um, this data set goes through all of many Minnesota, um, which is awesome and much larger than our scope of work. Um, here we are zoomed into the general area of St. Anthony Park, front and center. It's kind of hard to see what's going on here. So um, between Amanda and I, we have focused, used those data points and focused in on St. Anthony Park so we can really see what's going on here. So, oh, I already opened this. Okay, this is a tool you can use to explore this. So, totally interactive. You can zoom in and out just like Google Maps. Oh, I want to go the opposite direction here. Um, but here we have, there we go, Sa outline of St. Anthony Park. And going in here, you have a few ways you can play with this. Right now we have on um, two layers. In general, layers are um, a set of data that just has one type of data on it. Um, the colors are zoning areas, and the points are um, businesses and permits um, and that are active and inactive that are part of this WIMN um, data set, What's in My Neighborhood. So we can send out this link so you can explore more later. Um, basics of navigating this, you can drag and click. You can click on each of these and see what is this point telling us about resource research, recycling technologies, where they're located. Um, whether they are active or inactive, and also key. You can follow this link to find out more information about this site. Um, some common questions about this, um, just backing up a little bit, is there are an awful lot of uh, points on this map. All of these are active or inactive uh, sources of pollution, contamination in this neighborhood. Um, are they all a danger to me and my neighbors? The answer is, it depends. <laughs> uh, well, that's the tagline. Um, but you can find out more information about those following the link and I'm also talking with some folks here tonight. Um, this map is also really nice because we can see what sort of trends there are between um, points on this map and also some more social data on this neighborhood. So there are these little icons here where you can switch between the legend, things that are actively being displayed on this map. Here are zoning and the MPCA data. Um, and you can also change what you're viewing. So let's see. I don't want to see the zoning anymore. Um, let's look at how the concentration of these points interacts with median household income. Now, I apologize. St. Anthony Park is a little bit taller than this screen, so we'll have to move it around a little bit. This gives you a good idea. Okay, so we're seeing a majority of points in, uh, let me pull down a legend for us. Uh, median household income in the past year, in generally lower income areas, and fewer in North St. Anthony Park. Take that with what you will. Um, let's see. We have other things you can play with in that golden hour, as I said, of internet discovery. Um, average age, population density. Let's do that.
Oh, yeah. All right, so most dense in the south, less dense in North St. Anthony Park. Okay, and we also see higher concentrations of uh, pollutant sites. Okay, so this is a quick overview of things you can play with uh, at home. Um, does anyone have any questions offhand? Let's see, I would say, I would say that this data set um, is sort of like a snapshot from um, a point in time in order to, yeah, it is not actively updated in the way that we have to visualize this and cut this to work for St. Anthony Park. Um, so it can be updated regularly, but still that means that it's probably at least a year old at this point, um, but that's something I'm working on. Just get that updated into what is available now. The beauty of this site is that it is, active, uh, is updated every night. So you can see active permits, not active permits, things that are going on, um, sites that have, are under investigation currently, and maybe something has changed about the status of that. Um, so this site has all of the updated information on it. There are about three and a half census tracts for St. Anthony Park, and we've just highlighted the ones that are directly within it. That's a good point. So uh, on this map, um, let the, this red area to the south, um, is showing the data for a larger geography than you can actually see. So it's not, it is the average of the whole geography, but cut to just say an Anthony Park. So just some data nuance there to think about and remember as you're viewing it. All right, so blue is multiple activities. Nice and vague. Um, but you can find out more by clicking on each individual site. Um, that will give you more information about each of those. In general, we chose to go with this route rather than by uh, the permit that each site has in order to simplify the map. Like, for instance, each of these multiple activities points could have six or seven different permits with them, which is why it gets lumped together in multiple activities. Budget and sign graphics. Hazardous waste, small to minimal, minimal quant quantity generator. So this, at least on, um, from this point, seems like it's a permit for taking away some hazardous waste, but isn't necessarily a local environmental hazard. Um, just to confirm that, let's let's examine a little bit. Mm -hmm. It is just their their generator. Actually, thank you for that. I, I did look at this map, and I have had uh, a fair bit of experience with what's in my neighborhood, both the the pollution control agency's version of it, and then I don't know if you know, Department of Agriculture also has their version also has their version of what's in my neighborhood. And um, I knew that you were gonna be talking about this map and, th and one of the things that I thought perhaps I could offer to you was a little insight into what this data does and doesn't do for you. Um, some of the, the caveats were explained by Anna, but I could go into maybe a little bit more um, with that question. So if you look at the, the, the things that are in what's in my neighborhood, a lot of it is things that um, somebody's applied for a permit to do something. It does not mean that there's been um, a, a release of any sort necessarily. It, it could mean that there was a release at one point and now it's been cleaned up or now it's still on site but it's 12 feet underground with clean fill on it and a parking lot over it so it's inaccessible and nobody can be exposed to it. There may be a um, 
restrictive covenant on the property in case of future development so that somebody is aware that that contamination is still there, but it's not going anywhere, it's not posing any harm to anybody. So kind of as um, somebody jokingly but true said, it depends is really the answer to what's the hazard with any one of these things. I guess if I was to, to first look at the list of things that's here, um, the stormwater permits probably would not jump out at me as anything I'd worry about. That means somebody was gonna discharge stuff, probably a lot of dirt or runoff or something at a construction site or something else, and they just needed to let the, the stormwater management district know that this was coming. They apply for a permit, um, you know, running the stormwater and wastewater management system is, is highly complicated. They need to know what's coming at them. That's what the permitting process is, is to manage the flow, what's going into it, and then give those folks who operate the systems forewarning of what's coming along so that it's done planfully instead of just people throwing whatever they want down the stormwater system and messing it up when we all rely on that system. So I wouldn't probably worry too much about those. That's gonna take off some. Um, Tank sites, I could say, it really, in this case, it depends. Tank sites could be above ground or underground tanks that could be every gas station that's ever existed here, it could be anybody else's storage tank. Um, it could conceivably even probably be, although I don't think there's a lot of it in this part of town anymore, even fuel tanks that you know private residences might have had at some point. But lots of people have used tanks for a variety of things and sometimes the tanks are in great shape and still operating, they're above ground, they're inspected regularly, they have a pad around them to catch anything that's released, there's monitoring equipment on it. Sometimes it's a tank underground that's ancient and has been leaking for a long time, and maybe it's even empty by now. So it really depends on the site. It depends what was in the tank, it depends on the volume of the tank, it depends on if the tank is intact or if it's released product. So I think you could look into those, but you're not gonna get that just from clicking this. You're gonna have to probably contact somebody at the PCA, and you may find for a lot of these tank sites, they're closed now. Somebody came in, they pulled the tank, they have excavated the soil around it, maybe there was some release to groundwater, but nobody in St. Paul is drinking this groundwater, so again, you're not probably being exposed to it. The, the other side of that story is maybe it was a dry cleaner, released a lot of TCE from a tank, that those chlorinated solvents is now in groundwater, and it's migrated you know, five miles from that former tank site, and now it's causing what we call vapor intrusion, where those chemicals, they don't degrade well in the groundwater or the soil because of the, 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 the degree of chlorination they have, so the microbes don't break them down, and they are able because it's their nature to volatilize or evaporate off of uh, the liquid phase. So they're moving along in the groundwater and when the groundwater goes up and down in the ground, because it, it does fluctuate seasonally and sometimes with you get more or less water or there's drawdown on it, it goes up and down. And when it goes down, it leaves behind saturated soil with void space, including air in there, and then that's the place where it's evaporating up, and then it migrates its way up through the soil column and can even be pulled into buildings. And vapor intrusion is a phenomenon we've been dealing with a lot in concert with our Pollution Control Agency staff, and that's something that's happening pretty much anywhere you have an industrial history. So we do see sites like that. That's something that you wouldn't necessarily predict from the tank site, but that's something that can be happening elsewhere as a result of it. And that's actually very common. I brought some materials, and maybe I'll just mention it now. I brought some materials because Betty sort of primed me with some of the issues that people might be interested in. I thought I'll start with just uh, directing you to some of the resources that we or Pollution Control Agency or others have on these things, and I brought sort of a, a, a little um, small fact sheet or information sheet on vapor intrusion, kind of what is it and what do we see, and what are we dealing with a lot in, in um, Minnesota between us and the Pollution Control Agency, and there is one on vapor intrusion at that back table, so help yourself. And all the things that I brought you can find either on our website or you can usually see where it came from. Go and use the Google machine and find them yourselves too, so. Um, 
and I put my business cards too. So if anybody has questions that's not clear, or you're looking for additional resources on anything, you know, it really can be found. And sometimes just send me an email. I can point you to things that might be a little faster. But most of this stuff is readily available either from us at the health department, the PCA, EPA, or the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry is the group that I get my funding for. And they have a lot of information on virtually the health hazards of any chemical out there that's in common commerce or common at environmental releases, et cetera. But moving on, um, I would think that most of these small quantity generators is somebody's got a janitor closet or they have a small amount of something that they use and they probably use it responsibly. They, they know what they're dealing with. It's probably valuable to them. They don't waste it. It's probably not like the bad old days when people just threw stuff out because it was cheap. It worked really well, but then get rid of it by dumping it, right? You know, back alley or down the drain or in the, the dry sump or something. People don't really do that anymore. I think most of this small quantity is they, there's a rule, they have to notify that it's there. They probably handle it very responsibly. There might be some small amount of emissions to air, but it's probably fairly minimal in, in the grand scheme. But also the fire department needs to know what's on site everywhere when they go in case the building's burning down and something is there that's hazardous. Um, they, that's another reason why these things have to be registered so that emergency services is aware that they're on site. Um, I probably would not sweat about things that are small to minimum quantity generators for hazardous materials because they're probably products that somebody uses and needs and values and pays a lot of money for and handles them appropriately. I don't think that that's any indication that there's any significant release to the environment. Um, the other ones here, like possibly a VIC, Voluntary Investigation Cleanup, possibly a state assessment site, possibly a petroleum brownfield. These, to me, sound like sites where there's been evidence of a past release. So there's one thing to say that there's hazardous material, and everything could conceivably ha be hazardous. I don't want to say that like it's a scary thing. You know, everything could be toxic to us. Um, everything could be hazardous, uh, you know, in, in the wrong place at the wrong time, et cetera. Some things are worse than others, and some things have a technical definition of hazardous. But the, the point I'm really trying to make is there's a lot of things that are not harmful unless they get away or get out of control. And that's really where I would begin is has the question, has there been a release to the environment? And then what was the chemical or chemicals or, uh, or other hazards? Maybe it's a physical hazard. Maybe it's radioactive. Maybe it's something else. But what was released? How much was released? When did this happen? Is this old history and it's still there? On, on the books, but really the cleanup has transpired, the hazards have been minimized or mitigated or the contamination's been remediated by now, but the site is still on the books, so to speak. Um, there's probably a lot of sites like that in any place within a, a, an urban you know, history. Um, partly it's because the way we used to deal with these things, we all know the battle days, dilution was a solution, you put it out there. Um, we didn't know any better. A lot of people honestly didn't know any better, but sometimes people knew better and it was just the cheaper way. But it was legal, it was accepted, unfortunately. And now we all know better and we, we have this aftermath. I mean, it really is the truth. People thought you could throw things away, but there is no away. Um, that's always somebody else's, you know, drinking water, or air, or yard, or future, you know, property or something like that. Um, so the things I would look at, and again, it, the, 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 the statement that it depends is, is really true. It depends on what the history was, when was the release, if there was a release, what was released, how much was released, and then has it been dealt with yet? And really, I can't think of any way to get at that other than like find your dot that you're interested in, contact the Pollution Control Agency or the Department of Agriculture if you're looking on their website and say, can I come over and look at your files? Or do you have anything on your website? I mean, PCA does have a lot of stuff on their super fun sites and their investigations on their website. You could look there, but you may just have to contact somebody and say, I would like this, this kind of information about this site. Is there a site history you can easily send me? If not, can I come over and look at your files? And that's not easy to do. 
I, I made many years of my career looking through those you know monstrous sites and it's challenging but that's really where the answer is to how bad are any one of these points there's no that I'm aware of quick and easy way to just go to the website or go to the map and you have all the answers and you know which ones are bad and which ones aren't because um, really so many of these details such as was there a release where did it go um, you know is it still there is it 10 feet underground or is it at the surface um, it, it really depends because what we're trying to get at not only is is there a hazard still there that's accessible to people and then can it get into the body because really there has to be exposure for human health to be harmed and if it doesn't get into or onto the body in some way and it may the, the hazard that, that any chemical carries with it as a characteristic may depend on the route of exposure, how it gets to the body. Some things you can ingest and they're gonna go right through you, but if you inhale them, they're gonna do a lot of harm. So in some cases, it even depends how does it get into the body. Um, you may have contamination there, but it's not in a form that's gonna hurt somebody. There could be a lot of asbestos left behind at a place, but it's intact. It's not friable, meaning coming up into particulates that can be inhaled or you know nobody has access to it so it's a it's a hazard in that's its characteristic has that potential but it, currently there's no exposure happening so uh, the, the the unfortunate thing is it's not an easy question to answer it really depends on a lot of details and the only way I know about it is to start digging into pick your site dig into it and you're probably gonna have to contact the pollution control agency they're probably the people have the best information on it and then I would ask, please be patient, because these people are very busy dealing with a lot of regulatory things, trying to deal with getting these sites cleaned up. And I, I see it every day. They are incredibly overworked, really, really hard pressed trying to just deal with getting these things investigated, cleaned up. And in most cases, they're trying to negotiate with somebody who does not want to pay to do this work. And they're trying, they're every day out there in the trenches trying to get this stuff done for the rest of us. And they're fighting the good fight, but they're very busy people. So cut them a little slack too, if you do have to go ask them to do something above and beyond that's not their normal duty. They probably would be happy to help, but be understanding that they're, they're people and they really are um, extremely busy and hard pressed for the, the amount of work they have on these kinds of things. Um, Air permits, Kari, could you say more about that? I, I think it really, again, it depends on, on what is used, what could be released. Usually that's something that's reported and known, but it may, in a lot of cases, even what's on the permit be an exaggeration of what's coming out regularly. So you probably, again, want to know what the details are. Right, one thing I would mention is that it is, okay. One thing is that our air emissions, you can get some of the links from the NPCA's What's in Our Neighborhood, but that is another thing that we have a tool that if it's a facility that has an air permit, they are in general required to report their emissions to the NPCA annually. So even more so than the permit, that might be a good place to look is on our website that you can search for a facility and see what their emissions are. And we look for actual emissions, so they can be significantly lower. Like you mentioned, they might be have something that's called um, permitted to emit in their permit, which is the maximum amount they can emit. What we ask them to report is what they actually emitted. So that is definitely a good place to look. I would say if emissions and what's coming out of a facility from into the air is what you're interested in. My unit does that too, so <laughs> you can contact me with those questions. So I think that's all I had other than I'll mention. I brought some information because Betty said there were questions about a few other things. Like I said, vapor intrusion, we have an information sheet about what that is and kind of uh, a quick summary of what we've been dealing with a lot. And it was intended to explain to people who are at a site where we're trying to convince them to give us access so we can test their, their building. Usually it, it may be a home or it may be a workplace and they have to give permission. We can't go in and test for these things, even if it is protecting them. But you know, we're trying to convince them, here's what's going on. Please give us access so we can test to find out if we need to put in a system to protect you from the, the, the chemicals that are 
um, we have reason to believe are under your building and could well be coming in. I brought some information on radon. Radon's a naturally occurring um, issue. It's very common in Minnesota. We probably are, I don't know, the dubious honor ranked in the top four or five in the country for radon problems. It's the leading cause of lung cancer in non-smokers, so it's something that, you know, we're all susceptible to. It's something that's easily tested for. That's the good news. Easy, to, relatively easy and inexpensive to mitigate. And then you're going to be doing yourself a favor because you're going to face this when you go to sell your house. You might as well do it now and derive the benefits while you live there. And then you don't have to find a contractor to put the system in while you're in the middle of everything else you're worrying about when you're trying to get a house on the market. Um, just a word to the wise, there's a pamphlet on radon back there. We have a, um, a good radon unit at the Department of Health. I used to work in that group years and years ago. They are happy to always help, give information. We have a lot on the website. There's a pamphlets back there. They can even direct you to how do you test for radon, et cetera, if you have any questions. I brought in some information about trichloroethylene because that was a question. I don't know if it had to do with the air monitoring or not. Um, I brought in something on arsenic, again, it's sort of very general, um, and, and Kari, I think you mentioned arsenic, uh, again, it's a naturally occurring thing that's common in Minnesota soils. It is a drinking water issue in a lot of areas, um, but we, we do see it from other sources as well. Uh, again, it, it, it probably depends on, on what we're talking about as to what I would want to say about arsenic, other than just in generally, there's some information back there on that. What else did I bring? Um, information on lead. Lead is always a, a thing that we try and keep first in, in, in front of the, the public because people forget that you know, lead is a, a very serious um, hazard, danger to particularly children with the developing central nervous system. That's where it has its most profound effect um, and, and leads to a, a, a lifetime of, of problems, including um, a conceivably very significant decrement in, in IQ, and that you can imagine what the follow-on consequences that are. Lead, again, every child should be tested for it. Their pediatrician should be making sure that they do that on schedule. Um, if lead is found, there should be appropriate follow-up, but you know, sources of lead uh, range from naturally occurring to fallout and, and residue from years and years and years of leaded gasoline from auto emissions, um, leaded paint, um, conceivably lead in toys, conceivably lead in um, some ethnic medications or ritual supplies, conceivably in pottery glazes, et cetera. There's many, many sources. It, it just kind of be aware that it's out there. There is some information on lead, sort of its background and what, why it's still an issue. Um, it never goes away like arsenic, et cetera. These elements don't go away. They're, they're really, you're, you're not going to destroy them in any practical sense, you know. Um, we could send them up to the sun and do that, but it, we're, they, they are always here, basically, and um, we'll, we're, we're always going to have problems with that that we're always dealing with. So it's a good thing to be aware of if you have, you know, kids with grandkids or a neighbor with kids, you know, and you don't have any reason to be worried about it yourself, take one for them. Um, what else did I bring? I, d I threw my business cards up there. Oh, I brought something on our, our, our new fact sheet, we revised it, we worked with Department of Agriculture, Pollution Control Agency, Minnesota Extension, and a few others on um, a fact sheet on urban gardening and how to do that safely. If you have any concerns about it, some good tips on how to, you know, you can either go out and try and test and make sure your soil is safe, or you, there, you get a quick and dirty way to just kind of like be sure by some other, you know, using raised beds, et cetera, supplying the dirt yourself. Um, some good practical tips there, um, and your group even printed them out in color, so um, there's a bunch of them there, and that's also on our website. If you want to refer other people to it, take, take them. I don't want to take any of this home tonight, so I'm walking away from it. Yeah. You guys can find somewhere else to go with any of it that, that you don't use tonight. I think that's what I have, and I apologize if it seems like I'm a little disjointed, um, and I... I'm glad you accepted me in my biking gear too. So I, I think I'll just wrap it up there and unless there's questions. I want to uh, thank all of our presenters tonight. Let's give them all a round of applause again. <laughs>
we really thank you for taking your time. This is family time that you're taking away uh, to come to our community, so we really appreciate it. I just want to uh, reinforce that you're welcome to take the handouts that we brought. Um, and uh, if uh, there's anything that you're interested in that uh, we don't have there, um, we will have uh, certain uh, additional information. I uh, have s uh, some copies of um, the handouts, um, f uh, f which is a summary of the results from the air monitoring, too. Uh, just just a, uh, a short summary, but um, that will be uh, up on our website, the sapcc.org website. Uh, that summary will have a link for that and also a link for the urban gardening uh, uh, handout that uh, we have a copy here. So if you prefer not to take those but uh, want to see the information, you can go to our website. That'll be up soon. I don't think it's up yet, but those will be up. Again, I want to thank you all for coming out on this evening, and um, we've uh, really enjoyed having the presenters here tonight. And again, I want to thank all the local businesses that provided uh, support for this uh, program. Thank you again. And uh, then I think our uh, evening is uh, concluded here, and thank you for coming. <laughs>